Well, hi everybody, and welcome back to The Ultimate Fashion History with me, Amanda Halley, and an episode in a series I have running on the channel called 20th Century Style Icons, where we look back at some of the 20th century's most iconic fashion influences and fabulous people. And this episode came to me by way of my very good friend, Jorge, who is the director of the Museo de la Moda in Chile. And you know, I'm always talking about that wonderful place. And he wrote to me and said, Amanda, have you ever thought about doing an episode on Cass Elliot? And I loved this suggestion because what I always try to do in this series, 20th Century Style Icons, is to sort of move away from the usual suspects Audrey Hepburn, Grace Kelly, Jackie Kennedy, Sophia Loren, and celebrate other style icons. Um, and this year I wanted to be more diverse than ever, and so I love that Mama Cass, Cass Elliot, was suggested to me because the more I think about it, the more I realize that the most obnoxious idea that fashion and culture let's not just blame fashion, has ever come up with was the idea that every century or every decade has its ideal body. Now this is nothing new, we can't blame the 20th century or even the 21st century on this. Classical artists still study the Grecian ideal, this ancient classical view of the ideal woman and what her proportions should be. So this really is nothing new. In the Middle Ages, the ideal body, as you know, was tall and very slender. Um, in the 17th century, it was short and zuftig and curvy and, yes, I'll say it, plump. This is why I love the 17th century. They loved a curvy gal. And then, oh, at the turn of the 20th century, it was the hourglass to echo those curvilinear forms of Art Nouveau. In the 20s, we all know it was short and flat-chested. In the 30s, you had to be tall and thin, and then blah, blah, blah. In the 50s, the hourglass again. And it's obnoxious and it's exhausting, and I think it, it makes life very, very challenging. And I'm so glad that we have so many choices in the world today that we can all find clothes to suit our body types, no matter what the media tells us is the ideal body type. Yet I think that probably the, the most challenging decade of all time if to embrace fashion in a way that made you feel great was the 1960s, the mid 1960s. Because every garment practically was geared towards the so-called ideal body. And what was that body? Well, we all know what it was, as exemplified by the lovely Twiggy. The ideal fashion body of the mid-1960s was this body. Small-breasted, small hips, very thin, sort of gangly and adolescent, but not androgynous. I always go crazy when I hear the fashion body of the 1960s described as androgynous. It wasn't. Fashion didn't want its ideal body to look like a man's body or a boy's body. It wanted it to look like a child's body, really. This was the youth wake. And it absolutely worked with those tiny little micro looks of the 1960s, the mini skirt, the mini dress. Of course, Twiggy had this ideal body of the 60s and so did Diana Ross. She had this body. Jane Birkin had this body. Mia Farrow had this body and all of these ladies look absolutely gorgeous. And then came Cass Elliot who did not have what fashion decreed as the ideal body of the mid-1960s. And yet, Cass became one of the decade's greatest style and cultural icons. Her look and her lifestyle absolutely evoking that mid to late 60s Laurel Canyon, California scene that would find Cass at its absolute epicenter. Yet, she didn't start life with dreams of becoming a counterculture icon. Born Ellen Naomi Cohen, of Russian-Jewish descent, 
Cass was intent on a career in showbiz from a very early age. As a teen, she was active in high school shows and theater productions, and she dropped out of college to head to Broadway. And she was very almost cast as one of the leads in a big new Broadway show. But at the last minute, another talented unknown auditioned for the part and got it. Um, <laughs> one, Miss Barbara Streisand. She got the role of Miss Marmelstein in I Can Get It For You Wholesale. And it's interesting to think, isn't it, if Barbara hadn't auditioned, how her career may have progressed and how Cass Elliot's career may have progressed. But with a beautiful, clear, bell-like and utterly unique vocal talent, Cass, who had changed her name at this point, gravitated towards the burgeoning folk revival scene of the early 1960s. She formed the folk trio, the Big Three. Look at this still. Straight out of a mighty wind, isn't it? She then went on to be part of the more folk rock driven Mugwumps with her lifelong love, an unrequited one by all accounts, Denny Doherty, who brought her into a band being formed by his friend John Phillips. And the rest is pop history. The band, the Mamas and the Papas, becoming one of the decade's most popular. Their first single, The Haunting California Dreamin', something of an anthem to herald the move away from Mersey Beat and the British Invasion and into the jangling guitars and split harmonies of Californian folk rock and sunshine pop. Yet John Phillips was initially not at all keen on having the talented Cass join his new group. Sure, he loved her voice, and yes, he wanted two guys and two gals to make the four-way harmonies he wanted, but ideally, he wanted the second woman to look more like his wife, Michelle. There she is on the right. In short, he wanted the other woman to have that classical beauty like Michelle with that mid-1960s ideal body type. And if he'd had his way, the Mamas and the Papas may have been a success, those songs were great, but it wouldn't have had Cass's voice because it wouldn't have had Cass Elliot. And in my opinion, it was Cass who gave the band not only their iconic sound, but their utterly iconic look. And when it came to that sound, nobody sounded like the Mamas and the Papas. And it was Cass's voice, in my opinion, that gave them that distinct vocal sound like no other. Even when she isn't singing lead, it's Cass's beautiful voice that you hear. It's Cass's voice you listen out for, that's what I do anyway, and totally unconsciously. And as far as giving the band their look, it was the presence of Cass that made them so special, that made them look different. Without Cass, they'd have looked just like any other folk rock group out to make the scene in the mid-1960s. But with her majestic stature, thick auburn hair and love of paisley and psychedelic prints, it was Cass Elliot, Mama Cass, who pulled the visual focus. Not only did she exemplify the Californian counterculture dream of the 60s, she lived it. Her Laurel Canyon house becoming something of a drop-in center for all the young luminaries of America's music scene. I mean, look at this, the gang's all here, right? Everybody gravitating to Cass Elliot's home, the singer something of a den mother to the birds and the doors and Joni Mitchell and visiting British rock stars. Graham Nash called her the Gertrude Stein of Laurel Canyon, holding almost salon type gatherings with an incredibly high IQ of 165, Cass was as smart as she was talented and warm. And unlike so many of her counterculture pop star contemporaries, she didn't have that mistrust of anyone over 30. She didn't have that sort of chip on her shoulder. You know, everyone's against the man. She wasn't like that. She was so generous of spirit to everyone of any age. 
and this later made her such a popular and recurring guest on all the talk shows. Many of them are on YouTube and Jorge and I have been watching them and Cass is so charming and smart and informed and she really has something to say. But I'm here to talk about her relationship to fashion. And I always believe that what makes someone a true style icon is their relationship to fashion. And Cass had a great relationship to fashion. It was groovy. Understanding instinctively that those stiff and structured mini dresses of the era only really suited women with fashion's ideal body, Cass was at the vanguard of the flowing maxi gown and Eastern influence caftan. And she also had a lot of input into clothes designed specifically for her, like this beautiful ombre gown with the sunburst. But look at the yellow Stars of David near the hem. This was Cass's idea. She wanted the Star of David to be included to honor victims of the Holocaust and to speak to her own sense of pride as a Jewish woman. Cass absolutely understood every single one of fashion's ephemeral trends and made them all her own. From psychedelia to the deco revival to the spangles and sequins of 70s stage wear Cass was the quintessence of cool self-confidence in terms of her sartorial presence and far far more famous in her day than people might remember today after the mamas and the papas Cass had multiple solo albums and her own hit singles not only did she have her own successful TV shows, she endlessly guest starred on the TV shows of others. Here she is with Julie Andrews, here she is with Johnny Cash, and here she is with Scooby-Doo. She was so famous, so beloved, that she even made it to Scooby-Doo. This was sort of akin to Cass showing up in cartoon form on South Park or Family Guy. She really was perceived as one of the coolest women in the world. I think every teenager of the 60s and early 70s kind of wanted Cass Elliot to be their cool counterculture auntie who'd come over and agree with them that their parents were squares man, but that they should treat them kindly and respect them anyway. Cass was, I think, a true inspiration, and as I was putting this episode together in terms of her influence on fashion, she kept reminding me of Audrey Hepburn. How, you're thinking? Well, let's jump back to the 1950s and remember what that era's ideal body was. The hourglass silhouette with large breasts, large hips, tiny waist, ample behind. This was Marilyn's body. This was Elizabeth Taylor's body. Brigitte Bardot had this body and many other women who were held up as the physical ideal of the era had this body. And then came Audrey, small breasted, small hips, small derriere, rake thin. In fact, the opposite to what fashion decreed as its body ideal, yet Audrey was Audrey, the poster girl for the less endowed young woman. And with her beauty and grace and talent and style, she inspired young women who didn't have Marilyn's curves. She inspired them to embrace their inner beatnik and celebrate an arty, avant-garde, left-bank chic. In much the same way, I think Cass surely inspired young women who didn't have Twiggy's body to throw on something fabulous and exotic, let their hair fly free and embrace their inner earth mother. Now this should be a happy story as Cass was a woman who embraced joy when it did come her way. But sadly, yet perhaps not surprisingly, Cass suffered horribly from low body confidence and low self-esteem that came by way of a lifetime of body shaming. Feathered for her talent and respected for her smarts, she was also the butt of jokes by comedians on those very late night talk shows where she was often invited. This led Cass to endlessly embark 
on crash diets to take amphetamines to curb her appetite and she suffered bouts of deep, deep depression. And I can't help but wonder that had she not been body shamed so relentlessly, she wouldn't have suffered from such crashing lows and blows to her confidence. Body shaming is an awful, awful thing to do, and so many of us have been victims to it. As an adolescent, teen, and young adult, I was body shamed by my own parents, and I know that a lot of you were as well because we've discussed these issues in the Ultimate Fashion History Facebook group. You know, no matter what I achieved, it was always well done. Now, if only you weren't so fat. And I know I speak for so many of us. But imagine having to endure that sort of humiliation and slapdown in the public eye, as Cass had to, this incredibly talented, smart and informed young woman. Even in her horribly untimely death at a tragic age, humiliation haunted her. With that utterly untrue and unfounded rumour of the way she died. For the record, Cass Elliot did not choke on a ham sandwich. She died of heart failure, brought about by, no, not her weight, experts now say, but by years of crash dieting, amphetamines and the drugs she took in the hopes of escaping her darker moments. And it really makes me angry that a woman who had lived her life with so much grace and dignity and kindness had all of that taken from her in death by that stupid lie that, of course, the late night comedians made fun of. Yet she died at the very top of her game, about to start a residency at the London Palladium. Had she lived, she'd be 81 this year, same as my dad. And it saddens me so much to think of the rich and wonderful life she might have had and how we could have enjoyed her wit and wisdom and incredible voice for so many decades more. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of 20th Century Style Icons here on The Ultimate Fashion History. And it has inspired me to leave you with two lessons that it took me far, far too long to learn. The first is this, whatever your body type, believe me, that is the ideal body type. It is ideal for you. What a piece of work is man. We are all beautiful and we look exactly the way we're supposed to. Secondly, when it comes to fashion, let's borrow a lyric from Cass Elliot herself. No matter what the fashion media tell you, you've got to make your own kind of music and sing your own special song, right? I think if we follow those two rules, we can all be 21st century style icons.